Welcome to La Taverna Friuli Wines, the definitive podcast on wines from Friuli Venezia Giulia. I'm your host, Wayne Young. Hey, Friuli Wine friends, it's your pal Wayne Young here, La Taverna Friuli Wines, finally. An English episode for you people across the ocean, English speakers, Anglophiles, Anglo-Saxons, whatever you want to call yourselves anyway. Thanks for being here and spending some time with us. Interesting episode today with Michele Gargani. You know, it's strange. Michele is basically half Italian, half American, more or less. Grew up in the States, born in Italy, and one of the comments that we get very often, not only myself, but also Michele, because obviously Michele does have a bit of a uh, American cadence to his Italian when he speaks. Ben Little, who is uh, also English speaking, his Italian being also marked by an English accent. One of the things that we hear so often is that It's amazing that there are people who do not come from Friuli who are so deeply in love with Friulian culture and Friulian wine, especially. I think that is a testament not to our character, but to the character of Friulian wine because we've fallen in love with it because it's so special. I couldn't imagine living in Piedmont or Tuscany or maybe Sicily. Yeah, I could see myself living in Sicily, but there is something about Friuli and Friulian people and Friulian wine that somehow gets some of us, or maybe some of us get, maybe we could say it that way. But anyway, uh, it is not our fault. I don't think we're the special ones. I think Friuli is the special one. Friuli Venezia Giulia. Talking about the whole region here, but we just cut it short and say Friuli. So I am happy to introduce this conversation with Michele Gargani. We'll learn more about him and his story and his restaurant and his hopes and dreams. But speaking of hopes and dreams, how about you? What do you want to hear on La Taverna? Come on, drop us a line. You know where we are. We're on Facebook at La Taverna. We're on Instagram at my own personal Instagram page, which is Wayne Grape. All together, one word. You can send a message there. You can go to La Taverna Friuli Punto ET dot IT or even dot com. La Taverna Friuli dot com. And you can click a link and you can leave an email there. There's a contact page, believe it or not. Send me an email. Who do you want to hear from? Who do you want me to talk to? What kind of wines are you drinking these days? What am I doing wrong? I want to hear that too. Anyway, not going to hold you up any longer. Let's get right into the conversation with Michele Gargani from Al Yal Blanc. Okay, here we are with Michele Gargani from Al Gial Blanc, Osteria. Hey, no, Osteria, you got to help me out with that, yes, what you're going to yes. be doing up there. But thanks for coming and spending some time with us today, Michele. Tell us a little bit about yourself because you, with as, as Italian as your name sounds, you are not completely Italian. Correct, yes. Yeah, tell us I a little bit about your background. International. So I spent oh. my first seven years in uh, Tarcento, so north of Udine, if that's where my uh, Osteria, Trattoria, Eno Trattoria, we'll talk about it later, is okay. located. And uh, after that, I moved to Tuscany, where okay. my father lived. 
Okay. And Did you work? Were you working in the wine? Your father working in the wine business? No. There, or no? no, my dad was selling car. He has a, okay. he had his own business. Okay. Okay. And then after that, at eighteen, I moved to United States. Uh, my grandfather is American, so ah, okay. Grandfather on your mom's side? On my mom's side. Okay. Yes, yes. So my mom grew up between Friuli and uh, America. Okay. California. California. Yes. So, yes. Okay. And, so uh, you moved back to California when you were how old? Seven? No, I moved to California briefly when I was 10. Okay. I did one year of elementary school and then I moved back for good when I was 18. Okay, it, to California. To California, yes. So from 10 to 18, what were you doing? Were you back here in, in Italy? I was back in Italy, oh, okay. yes, yes, in Tuscany. Oh, okay, so you were really bouncing back and forth there for a while. Yes, yes, back okay. and forth. Okay, that's why your English is so good and your Italian is so good. Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Not like my Italian, which is like super Americanized. <laughs> <laughs> Alfredo. Alfredo, exactly. Fettuccine Alfredo, <laughs> an espresso. I need an espresso. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. So, so you said so at 18, you were back in California. Yes. Okay. I was living in Los Angeles. All right. I've worked in restaurants there as a cook first and okay. then a chef. Okay. So you are a chef by trade. Yes, I am a chef. Why yes. the hell would you do that work? What got you involved in the world of cooking? I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> What's that? It's such a masochistic, can you say, is that a word in English? That's, that's exactly yes. what Joe Bastianich would say. Yeah. Oh man, it's a masochistic job. It's the hours are insane. When everybody's having a good time, you are working. Uh, and it's very fatiguing. I mean, physically, you know, it's very, very demanding. And uh, no, you're on your feet, you're in front of a hot stove or a hot uh, oven or whatever all day. Yeah, it's demanding physically and mentally. Yeah, yeah. And uh Especially when it's a uh, go time uh, during service and the restaurant is full and you have so many tickets piling up and you just try to keep your cool. But it's even more stressful when you manage big restaurants. Of course. Because then you have staff that don't show up, staff that show up drunk, or at least that was the case in California. I'm not <laughs> sure that is the case everywhere, but that's what I've, that's what I've experienced. And they can get very stressful because... You count on these people to show up. Of course. And then they don't. And yeah. You, you always find yourself um, putting holes in the, how do you say in English? Uh, oh, yeah, one, sticking no? your finger in, yeah, t plugging up leaks. That's uh, the word. In the dike, like the little boy in Holland, right? You Correct. stick your finger Correct. in the hole just to stop the flood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So I decided to uh, take a break mm -hmm. from the from the restaurant chef. world. Okay. Yeah, so no, no, from the so where chef. did you work in California before we move on to the next so phase? So I, I was lucky to work at some great places. Mm. I worked at Melisse, which was rated number two best restaurant in Los Angeles. It wow. was a French restaurant, although it was a short experience, but I learned a lot. And then I worked at Enoteca Drago, which was in Beverly Hills, an Italian restaurant with a great wine list. Although back then I didn't really know much about wine. Uh, I opened a small restaurant on Sautel. On where? On, in Los Angeles, on Sautel, on the, between four or five and, uh, clo uh, on the exit of Sepulveda on the four or five, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. If you know. This has to be like Los Angeles talk. It's Los Angeles yeah, talk, yeah, meet stuff me. Stuff that I don't understand. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, like us in New Jersey, and we say, oh, yeah, what exit are you from? I'm 144. Oh, okay, I know where you are now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we talk like that on the side. Just, oh, yeah, over Laurel Canyon. That kind gotcha, of stuff. yeah, which, yeah. But basically close to Santa Monica. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. There I've been. Yeah, oh, very nice place, very yeah. nice place. Yeah, yeah. So I, we, I had that for about a year and a half. It, it was a pizza place. I had the ambition to do like a little franchising, maybe... A little too American of me. Instead of focusing on my skills, I was focusing on business. Okay. Uh, to, I was like, oh, this project is going to make a lot of money. But what I end up doing is losing a lot of money. Oh, okay. So, like a lot of people do in the restaurant business, unfortunately. Yes, yes. Yeah. So many mistakes I've made, even though the restaurant was very busy and there are people that still email me about that restaurant. Huh. Oh, we That's miss good. your food, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I made too many mistakes that could not recover, so we sold it. And then I moved to Paso Robles. 
Ah, okay. And that's when I really started to fall in love and understand wines. Uh huh. So in Paso Robles, I worked for a little bit in this restaurant called Via Creek. That at the time it was owned by one of my wine mentors, Chris Cherry, who is the owner of the winery uh, Via Creek and also a uh, Maha Estate. Okay. And uh, he has been uh, a very imp- impactful, yeah, person uh, for for the wine. And the wine that made me fall in love with the winery was actually an Aglianico. Ah, so an Italian grape variety and, in California. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. A grape variety that I believe has a lot of potential in the area, although granted it was also planted in one of the best vineyards okay. in Paso Robles. Uh, otherwise, Paso Robles is more known for Grenache, Mourved, and Syrah. Okay. So Rhone Ranger guys. Rhone Ranger guys, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this is sort of where you started falling in love with wine. Yes, yeah. wine and vineyards. And vineyards, yes. okay. Why, why do you say, why do you specify wine and vineyards? Because they're almost, although they're together, they're two separate things. Many okay. people talk about wine, wine, how the wine is made, and all these, about the enological part, you know? Oh, what's the uh, aging? Is it oak? Is it stainless steel? Blah, 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 and all this stuff. But what people don't talk about, much about it's the vineyard work oh, okay and the soil and the geology and the climate which are so important super important yeah, yeah yeah and so do you have a memory of like one is it that adianico that sort of really kind of like popped for you when you were like fuck wine is really good and i want to learn more i want to do more was there one particular wine or was there was it sort of an evolving slow burn type of thing it was definitely not an evolving thing. I started to really get interested in wine uh, before Paso Robles. A little bit before, okay. Yes, in Los Angeles, I started building my little cellar. And that's the reason why I moved to Paso Robles, because I said, you know what? I don't want to be in Los Angeles anymore. I, I'm tired of the big city. Let's move to the countryside. Right. And uh, I visited Paso Robles several times. And I also visited Santa Barbara and Napa Valley and Sonoma. But Paso Robles had a special energy to it. It was very uh, non-posh and very cowboy. It felt very California to I me. I like that. Okay. Very mm, cowboy. Very cowboy. And the people there were splendid, very real, very, um, yeah, real. I, 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 not I pretentious. Not pretentious, yes. Not, not with a tie and <laughs> pretending to be cool. Right. The, the, the winemakers there and they take care of the vineyards, they could get a rattlesnake from the, from the neck and just throw it <laughs> under the bushes. Yeah. Really? Yes, yes, so, yes. Wow, okay. So. And uh, another person that really, really made me fall in love with wine was Justin Smith from Saxon. From Saxon? Saxon. Okay. Saxon, it's a cult winery in California. Okay. But the wines are splendid, and I had the opportunity to taste verticals inside his cellar, which is beautiful by the way it's dug underground. And so there, I really started understanding also because he has vineyards plant vineyards planted in different areas. Okay. And when we would drink the wines, he would explain why certain wines taste like this, another wine tastes like that, and it was kind of easy because although they were blends. They were mostly, you know, Grenache Syrah based. Okay. And he explained why here I have more Syrah, here you have more Grenache, you have more Mourved. So it was quite uh, fascinating. That's when I really started to understood, understand okay. the importance of, of the place. Of the place. And, yes. and the vineyard and things like that. Yes. Like you were saying, not just the wine that comes in the bottle, gets served at the table, but, you know, all of the work and the decisions that go into to making it. Yes. Did you do any, um, did you do any experience in a cellar or making wine? Yes, I was lucky yeah. to work, uh, mostly cellar work. The vineyard work was limited at, on harvesting. Right. Okay. But, but I did a little bit of cellar work. I did uh, work at this winery called Jada. Always Paso Robles. Always Paso Robles. Okay. So yeah, so I I got to work with uh, Grenache, Syrah, uh, Mourved, and they all behave very differently. Huh. Yes. Uh, so you become really, intimate with these grape varieties. Yes, yes, yes. Huh. And 
also I had the opportunity to visit often during harvest this winery called Giornata. Giornata, it's a winery that focuses on Italian varieties. And perhaps one of the, if not the most successful winery who the, who makes wine with Italian varieties. Oh, okay. Giornata, it's called. Giornata, yes. Oh, okay. Sangiovese and Nebbiolo. And Nebbiolo is really very unexpected, you know, in Paso Robles. Because in Paso Robles, you think, oh, it's such a hot place. But the truth is, yes, it's very hot. And so you need some serious vineyard management, especially to not cook out the flavors of Nebbiolo of grape. But he said that he picked Paso Robles because, uh, because of the soil. Okay. Because he really loved Nebbiolo. He wanted, he was looking up the best place to plant Nebbiolo in California, and he picked Paso Robles. I had a friend who made Nebbiolo, or he, maybe he still does, but I think he sold his winery, um, Steve Clifton. Jeremy Steve, Steve Clifton, Clifton, yes, yes, of course. Brewer Clifton, and then he also had Palmina. And he, I remember, and this, it's been, God, it's been 20 years since I've tasted his wine, unfortunately, but his Nebbiolo was spectacular. I yes. mean, it was, for me, it was like, that's as close to Piedmont Nebbiolo as you're going to get outside of Piedmont. <laughs> so. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you've tasted that as well. Yes, yes, yeah. I've tasted it. He makes several crews. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's in Santa Barbara, I think. Yeah, he's yeah. in Santa Barbara. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway. And so, Paso Robles, lots of, of, this is where you start falling in love with wine. This is where you start sort of really cutting your teeth, experiencing, getting an idea of how important the, terroir and the soil is for the for the vines but then you changed completely yet again yes yeah so i opened a restaurant at paso robles it was going well but i decided to leave i was tired of it okay a little bit of burnout maybe a little bit of burnout and i said i don't want to be in the kitchen anymore okay and i got this job offer from a wine merchant in thailand ah. to be a sommelier of the of their restaurant, I didn't realize how important this restaurant is in Bangkok, okay. which is as one uh, multiple times uh, for, uh, actually for several years now, I think every year they repeat themselves of having the best, being the best wine bar of Bangkok. Uh-huh. And there is a lot of wine in Bangkok. Okay. And so, what the name of this place was or is? Is. The name of the restaurant is La Casa Nostra. Okay. Fantastic restaurant, great wine list. Uh, the food is fantastic. Nino, the chef, is a great chef, so I highly recommend it. And they are affiliated with a uh, wine merchant. Okay. The, the owner, Aman and Nan, are a super team. They're kind of like, they're becoming kind of like the Berry Brothers of, of Thailand. Of Thailand, yeah. yes, yes. What's it like selling Italian wine in Bangkok? Must be it's a challenge. interesting. Yeah. Yes, well, the Thai market, there are, the, the younger crowds are a little more open. Okay. But the older crowd still uh, is very much focused, I guess, on brand. Because uh -huh. drinking labels. wine, labels, yes. Drinking wine is still very much a social status thing over there. So. They kind of flex the most expensive bottle. In okay. fact, sometimes they would come in the cellar and the first question would be, which one is the most expensive bottle? Really? Yeah. They would literally yes. do that. Wow. Oh yeah. Or sometimes they call, like I remember this call and they ask me, I'm looking for a Tuscan wine. I said, no, Italian wine. I said, oh great. Which one would you like? He said, the best one. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, you know, we have plenty of fantastic wines. We have Barolo. We have... Brunello. And, Super uh, the, Tuscans. And, yeah. And, and he said, no, no, I want the best one. The best one. So I, I, I'm i thinking, I said, oh, you want Maceto? Stuff like, oh, okay. Uh, okay. I got that. Okay. Yeah. And is that what he wanted? Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. It's, you have to, you have to name, it's either Sassicaia or Maceto. Or Maceto, yeah. Or Redigafi, you know. One those, of those, those big ones. Yeah, yeah. the big ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, Maceto is the most expensive wine. In Italy. From Italy right now. Is it not? Or am no, I, I think it's Monfortino. It's Monfortino? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Yes, I think the price of Monfortino skyrocketed. Okay. It's over a thousand bucks. That's incredible. That's good. I guess that's good news. I guess we're, we're sort of getting into that that territory there. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so you were you were doing the wine list for this wine bar in Bangkok, or were you also like selling wine out on the market as well? I, I can't take credit for doing the wine list because we only had wines from our uh, your importer, your distributor. exactly our importer okay. distributor. So basically, I just. I just ordered the wine when we need it and stock okay. them up and then sell Were them. you like front of the house? Were you like in front of people telling them what to get? and Front of the house, yeah. I yeah. was a manager, the okay. manager. But, you know, the, the chef was kind of managing a lot more than I did in many a aspects. Okay. Uh, I mostly I sold wine and kind of did what he told me to do. Okay. So did you learn to speak a little bit of Thai as well? A little bit. Yeah. But it's very in um, at a baby phase, but... But I can speak a little you bit. You can speak a little bit yeah. of Thai. Yeah. But you, you didn't find the language barrier a problem for selling wine? No, because most of the clients there spoke English. Spoke English, yes, okay. Yeah. I didn't have to describe wine and Thai. I, could, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Oh, okay. But I can tell them where the restroom is or <laughs> like <laughs> the items on the menu, stuff okay. like that. Yeah. In Thai. In Thai. That's pretty yes. good. Yeah, yeah. Difficult language? It is a difficult language. It's a difficult language because you have no reference point. And also, it's one of those languages where you cannot afford to have an accent because it's very phonetic okay, based. Okay, right. So one word can mean so many five different, different thing. things and just changes so ever so slightly. And so you, and even you would think, well, don't they contextualize what I'm talking about? But they're so used to that. that right. That they, yeah. So if you, if you mess understand. up the accent, that you mess up the whole meaning of this. Yes. Thing. Okay. Yes. Like Chinese. So, um, how many years in Thailand? Two years. Two years. Two years. Not much. Okay. Not and long. then, and then I look up at this guy and I saw the Friuli flag and I said, "I have to come back." Where did you see the Friuli flag? In the sky. In the sky. I yeah, was it looking just, at it the just, sky. It just appeared to you. Yes, actually, called to you from the heavens. Correct. Love yes. it. It's the idea of moving back to Friuli always stimulated me. And as I got older, it got stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm. I really wanted to come back and do something great here. Even though you, the most of the time that you spent in Italy growing up, you spent in Tuscany. Yes. But there was always something about Friuli that pulled you back. You stayed, you said you stayed here until you were like seven or eight. Yes. It's my nest. It's your nest. It's my nest. It's where you feel comfortable. And somehow I always felt Friulano. My identity always felt Friulano. I okay. guess it's kind of the land that chose me. I was, I was always in love with this really? area. Yes. You know, that happens a lot. I had another friend that the exact same happened. He was, he was born here, st spent just a few years young here, moved to Germany, then moved to the States. And then he came back here as an adult. So it's, I, there's something about Friuli. You know, can you put into words sort of what, I mean, yeah. And saying that it's your nest, it's your, it's your happy place. It's your comfort zone. You know, wh wh why do you think that you have this feeling for Friuli as a place? I don't know. Um, it's uh, maybe a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, but the place. Those. Yes. <laughs> But the place is, is beautiful. No, I guess it's hard to explain. It's more emotional than anything. I just feel like it's, I'm at home here. Okay. More than any other place I have ever been or lived. That's, that's, that's amazing. It's really amazing that some place made such an impression on you. So you saw Friuli in the stars and you decided yes. you were going to come back here. When was this? This was October, 2021. October, I came back. 2021. Yes. You came back here. I came back here. Okay. Yes. So like full-blown pandemic time more no no at the, at the end was right yeah, at the end. but i still okay. had to do the vaccine before getting on the on the airplane okay. and all that kind of stuff yes all right and so came back here october 2021 yes and your intention was what what were you gonna to do open here? a restaurant so here. that's what you wanted to do that's what i wanted to do so clear crystal clear that's what you wanted to do yes i wanted wow. to open a restaurant just like i have now with fantastic wines okay and then in the future, my dream, my it's in my in the pocket in the drawer. I don't know. Yeah, your Sonia nel cassetto. Sonia nel cassetto okay. would be to make wine one day. Well, we're gonna talk about that. Yes, yes. yes. But so you found basically an, a historic trattoria near Tarcento here. Yes, it's called Segnaco. 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 
called Al Gial Blanc, yes. which is Friulano for the white rooster. Rooster. Or right, white cock. Yes. yes. Easy now. <laughs> this is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so tell me about that, that process of finding, yeah, was it an easy thing or did you like go through a bunch of different places that you looked at before you settled on that? Or was it like love at first sight? It was love. I didn't even see the place. I only saw it on video. No kidding. Yes. So I was looking for a place online when I was living in Thailand and I, but Really, and online, you don't really find much. You kind of have to be on the territory, really, yeah. to to find uh, the, the a ground. good place. Yes, but instead, I stumble upon this place in Tarcento, of all places, which is you know where, I where you, you where you were born, where my nest is. Yeah, yes. So, really, drew you back home. Yes, yes. Wow. And I sent my cousin. I said, "Can you go look at this place and take a video?" Because prior to that, I actually um, went to see some, I, I didn't went personally, but my mom, she was, she happened to be in Italy. So she went to see some places and uh, we were looking mostly in Manzano, Butrio, okay. because that's where I kind of knew more people. But everything was too run down, very expensive. And, and I said, okay, I have to be there. Otherwise I can't, I'm not going to find anything online or rely on other people. But as I said, I found this place online and my cousin went there and I said, oh my God, I love it. Really? The price, the price was right. The size was right because I wanted a small place. Okay. Because I was going to manage it on my own at the beginning at least. I knew I was going to be in the kitchen alone and I still am. Okay. So I don't want any more than 35 seats. Okay. Okay. But so, it, so this was, yeah. And so the, you said the price was right. Place was right. You know, not too big, not too small. Uh, was in good shape, obviously. It was in very good shape. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it was, re it was sort of really easy for you to sort of step into. Yeah. Very easy. Yeah. Very easy. I mean, some stuff, like we say in Friulano, le rogne sono venute fuori. Some <laughs> issues came out because it is a very old building. Yeah, but that's. I'm not sure the exact date. Right. But it's the early 1900s. And before huh. 1915, that I know. But it has the plaque for like Osteria Storica. Lord. Yes. It's been there for a while. Yeah, yeah, it's been there for a while. It's been owned by several people. I heard some fun stories about it. So that that, that place has seen it all. Two wars. Really? Yes, wow. yes. First and second. And it's so there's great a lot, to of, see. lot of soul. A lot of soul inside, yes, yeah. yes. And, and you can really, at least I can feel it. Right. I really like it. Oh, okay. And some of the pieces are still original. The floor is still original. Yeah, that tile floor in the front room, that yes. first room. That's original from when the house was built. Yeah. Wow. It's in really great shape, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good shape. Considering it's been through two wars. Yeah, they knew what they were doing back then. Yeah, exactly. exactly. No, but the, the building looks, I mean, it has a really classic look to it, but it looks very well maintained. Right. So... And so what's your, well, obviously you've been open for, when did you open at Gal Blanc? June, 2022. June, 2022. Yes. So not even a year. Not even a year. Yes. Wow. So I met you when you were like just super fresh opened. Yes. Because yes. I met you like what, last summer? Yeah. So you yeah, had ju basically right. just opened. Yeah. Yeah. Last summer, last fall, maybe. So and I was like, oh, wait, this dude speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about wine and make dirty jokes together. <laughs> Nobody else will understand. So yeah, we got along right away. Plus you're good friends with Ben. Yes. Ben Little. So, and he's been on the show. So you and I sort of like hit it off right away. And then, so you have a particular plan for this place. I mean, you're not going for uh, Stellati no. at Yal Blanc. No. What, what is, what's your sort of, your focus? My focus is to really... I'm not looking for personal glory. Okay. I, like I said before, identity. I like identity. So I want this place to be part of the identity of the territory. And for that reason, I only use vegetables and, and uh, animals that come from the area. And I mean like very close. It's like a micro-regional uh, cosmo. Really? Yes. So no, uh, no vegetables from, not even like Aquileia. 
No, that I can tolerate. Yeah. Okay, that you can tolerate. <laughs> okay, but nothing from nothing from Tuscany. No, no meat from Tuscany. So no Fiorentina from Tuscany. No. If you're gonna do beef, you're gonna do beef from Pezzata Rossa. Yeah, that's the that that's the uh, the the breed. Right, that we have here in Friuli. That we have here in Friuli. Yes, right, right, yes. Right. So you are there actual uh, people that you buy stuff from in Tarcento, like in literally like in the town. Where you have, or do you have to go a little bit further afield? Tricesimo. Tricesimo. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So two kilometers down yes. the road, basically. Yes. Okay. So well, what are we talking about? Give me an idea of some of the things that you get locally that, uh, that you source so close by. So the menu is really dictated on what is available. Okay. So you only make what's available. So I only make what's available. The menu changes all the time. Uh, it's a bit of a risk because sometimes people come back uh, to get that dish, but actually uh, it's proving to be a good thing because my menu is so limited that when you come, there's always something, something new. new. Yes. Yeah. I work with these farmers, Orto di Zagara, and I like their, also, their philosophy because I also, I only work with uh, people that I share the same philosophy with and they don't use any pesticides on their, if they lose a crop from animals or whatever it is, they lose it. And so I work with whatever they have available. So the menu, it's about, you know, five, six items. Okay. Yeah, at the most. And uh, give us an example of some of the things that you, you're, you've had recently or that you're, you've made in the past that you really, really like or what, that's been really uh, successful. Yes. Uh, goulash. Goulash. I make goulash that quite uh -huh. often. Uh, that has no season, of course. I will not make so much goulash in the summer, but it's that's... It's a little heavy. It's a little heavy. For July. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, every dish I make respects the tradition. Okay. So even though... Some so you're not doing like Nouvelle Cuisine here? No, no baby no. food puree, no powders. Gotcha. Yeah, nothing like that. Yeah. No... Uh, I could, yeah. but I don't. No pearls. No pearls. <laughs> or or gelat gelatinous little beads. <laughs> Oh. Negroni spheres. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you're really trying to get super local, super fresh, traditional dishes. Yes. To, okay. I and basically, basically make the, daily. Yes, I, I, I make the food the way I like to eat. Okay. And the way I like to, and, and I don't want to make it so that you have to think about it too much. Better you think about the bottle of wine you have in front. Uh -huh. You can have two, two super complex things. One has to be very good. And I think the food... It's successful when you see people attacking the food. They love it so much that they don't think about it. They just eat. Eating it, yeah. To me, that's the best compliment. Okay. Yeah. So you like you like seeing people eat. I like to see people eat and drink. So you you must really like it when I come. Because <laughs> I eat a lot. Uh, but anyway. So yes, yeah, so and I love the fact that you're sort of coming from a very complex and very high-end uh, level of of cooking and you've come back home to this sort of home style, very, very well done, but very traditional types of dishes. So no more highfalutin crazy stuff, but you want to give people the stuff that they're used to eating, but doing it really, really well and really, really local. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And big focus on wine. Yes. As well. We have a small, but growing wine list. Okay. Right now, I am focused mostly on uh, the area that are very close to me. Okay. So Tarcento and Savorniano. I have, I think, yeah, every single producer of Savorniano del Torre. Okay. And a few others. Is that just because of the proximity that they're, they're close to? It's because of that proximity. Well, it's because, again, the, the philosophy of uh, the microcosmo. Gotcha. Uh, but the wine list is going to grow. Okay. My dream is to see, or my ambition, I should say, my dream is to be Elon Musk's son and be able to fly maybe, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But my goal is to see people eating traditional dishes like gnocchi, goulash, but with a bottle of Miani or even something crazy like Monfortino in the future. How cool would that be? Yeah, exactly. So it, it seems to me that as much as you love cooking and, and as much as, as important as the restaurant is to you, what you're looking to do is you're looking to have like the food almost take kind of a backseat and almost. that the focus to be 
on that experience because like you said, you can't have a really complex dish and a really complex wine. Right. So you have a really complex wine. You're talking about Monfortino here. Right. Right. You're, obviously, you, you, it's going to be hard to compete with a wine like that. Right. So you're looking for that perfect dish to accompany and pair with, but you want people to be talking about the bottle on the table. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, go on. So almost like a eno trattoria would be the word. Okay. So it's a, an enoteca where you eat very well. Now, if I say that some people might get scared, they say, oh my God, no, we love your food. Don't, don't take that route. No, no. The food is still going to be just as good okay. and the same. Right. The only thing that's going to grow is the wine list. So, of course, we're going to put a lot of attention on the wine list. But the food is always going to respect the same uh, philosophy and it's always going to have the same quality. Okay. We, actually, we always look to improve anyhow. So, anybody listening, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The food is going to be great. The food is going to be there. Yes. It's always yes. going to be always gonna Chef be. Michele's food. Yes. But with with some some more options on on cool wine. Correct. Yes. And you're, so it sounds like you're going to go outside region as well if you're talking about Monfortino. Yes. Yes. Eventually, it's it's still going to be very Friuli focused. Okay. Probably eighty percent. Eighty percent. Okay. But I will have some petardo, like we call it in Italian, but some really great wine from other regions of Italy and perhaps France. It would be even cool to, in the future to have something from California, but they're a little less accessible here. Y as far Italy. as like being able to buy. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's the that's the plan. Eno trattoria. Eno trattoria. I am looking for a cook to help me. So uh, okay. anybody listening, sto cercando un cuoco. <laughs> Okay, well, that's probably the biggest challenge right now in the restaurant business all over the world, but especially in Italy. My wife also being in the restaurant business, very, very different organization there, very mm. big, but really hard to find people. Is that something that you've had a problem with over the last year, finding people to help you? That's what I hear. I haven't really looked for anybody yet because my brother was helping me in the restaurant. Okay. But now the restaurant is getting quite busy and uh, and we always barely make it through. We always make it through, but barely. Okay. So I I really need help now. Okay. And when I ask around, everybody's like, good luck. That's, it's a, <laughs> that's <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> Everybody who I've spoken to has said the exact same thing. They're like, yeah, they have to forget it. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really hard. So you need one person in the kitchen. What about the front of the house? Who's Who's running that for you? You got your brother? Well, I would be running the front of the house. Okay. So that's the idea. I'm there helping selling the okay. wines. Okay. So you need you want somebody in the kitchen who's going to be sort of running the cooking and all that sort of stuff. So this way you can come out of the kitchen. Yes. And deal with the people directly. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. So I will still prepare the food because, you know, goulash is not something you make at the moment. Yeah. You know, it's you, not like you just throw in some meat and you're ready to go. Exactly. You heat it up. So I'm going to organize the menu in a way where uh, everything is ready for him. Just, you know, the sauce for the pasta is already made. He has to cook the pasta and, and saute. Gotcha. And when it comes to make cold cuts, maybe I can do. I, right now, one chef, if he, if he would have to do what I'm doing right now, he would run away. Okay. <laughs> because I'm doing way too many things. Okay. But I would, I would give him his station. Okay to do four dishes and then every once in a while I would go back and help. Kind of, You kind of have to be creative with these things in Italy. And so yeah, so, so yeah the food is still going to be mine, but I, will, I want to be in front. I want to talk to my customers. I okay. want to sell them wine because sometimes, and also because they don't understand how the kitchen works. So they want to come and talk to me and, 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 and it's like, oh, okay, do you have a minute? It's like, no, no, I, I don't have I, a I second have like right now. I have 15 fucking plates yeah. to cook right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this will give you a little bit more time to, you know, and I think that's, I think that's important because for me, you know, and, and I've met your brother and I've met some other people who help you out. For me, that place is you. Okay. As much as I like your brother, but right. you're that, I go there because I want your food and your wine. Right. So, uh, yeah, for you coming out of the kitchen and being sort of the face of Galblanc and being out there and suggesting wine, 
try, oh, with that dish, you got to try this wine. Or maybe you have a little something like you did with me last night under the bars. Come here, come here, bring your glass. I'm going to give you a little bit of this instead of the stuff that the everybody else is drinking or whatever. You know, that type of thing is, is, is powerful, you know, and once you get known as the guy, people go to see you and they'll say, we're going to go to Michele's. They're not going to say we're going to go to Gavis. Exactly. I want people to feel like at home. Yeah. In fact, that's what I really like about the place I worked in Thailand. The name of the place was La Casa Nostra. Okay. And and it's a clever name because it it means our home our house yeah, yeah our house yeah. and i want that feeling yeah i have customers who come uh that are regulars that they have fun you know i let them go behind the bar and you know i know you shouldn't but you know right. for that second why not they feel at home they exactly. feel empowered you know they they like to bring their friends and they and they and they they pour them the wine and and they feel like at home exactly exactly but you have some more ideas when it comes to wine. So you're thinking about? Yes, I'm thinking about making a little wine. No, okay. that is a little dream I have, but it might be more achievable, achievable than I first thought. Okay. I cannot speak about anything now. You know, in Italian we say, non dire gatto se non ce l'hai nel sacco, sure. which actually rhymes in English too. Don't yeah. say cat if you don't have it in the sack. Although yeah. it sounds a little creepy, but... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Or, or ne yeah, never buy a pig in the poke, they say, right? Oh, never, yeah, buy, never heard never, that. Yeah, never buy a pig in a bag because you never know what's inside. Mm -hmm. But, um, oh, so, you're, so you want to make wine? Yes. Or, but are you like going to collaborate with another winery or are you going to, you know, find your own space and maybe find some vineyard that you can rent? Tell me a little bit about how you're going to do that. Uh, it all depends on the uh, on what I'm gonna encounter, right? With all the people I'm meeting and all the opportunities that are gonna come up, but I do have an opportunity, perhaps if it if it follows through, to make wine in my own facility and have my own small vineyard, which again, just like the restaurant, small. Exactly what I wanted. Okay. No more than 1,000 liters because I don't want to get into the wine business. Then, right. I, then I don't want to start hating it, right? Because <laughs> making a good wine, point. making a good wine, it's hard. Yeah. But selling it, it's even harder, especially when you're the last one to come in. Yep. I make enough wine where I can sell it at the restaurant. I can be happy with it. And can drink it yourself. Drink it myself. I don't have to think about Christmas gifts. You know, everybody gets a Magnum. There you go. And yeah, and there we go. So what do you want to make? I would really like to make a great age-worthy white wine. Uh-huh. And so how, what, what would you, what kind of grapes would you use? How would you sort of put together a great age-worthy white wine in Friuli? In Tarcento, are, are the vineyards in Tarcento or are they Yes, near? the vineyards in Tarcento. In Tarcento, yes. okay. Well, tasting the Tokai from Luca Belluzzo, from Belluzzo Winery, who makes a phenomenal, I mean, the whole range is phenomenal. Okay. From the Refo he makes a fantastic Refosco, a fantastic Merlot, and I'm really in love with his Tokai. Hmm. which is something that you don't really associate with Tarcento, but only because historically there, uh, the vineyards were planted with Refosco, Refosco Nostrano, or okay. Refosco di Faedis, Faedis yeah. and Verduzzo. Over there, it's the, uh, you can still make Ramandolo. So, oh, really? Yes. You can yes. still make Ramandolo in Tarcento? Yes, yes. Ah, it's part Tarcento. of the DOCG. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. this I didn't know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Verduzzo, it's a fantastic grape variety. But as far as making a dry wine, although good, I don't think it's very elegant. Okay. Well, Tokai can reach fantastic elegance. Okay. So you're looking at, at Friulano. You're looking at Tokai. Tokai, yes. Yeah. And for Landed? people that don't know, Tokai, Friulano, it's still the name of the variety. It's Friulano that is the name of the wine. Exactly. You cannot call it, but you can still call it Tokai Friulano. Yes. In fact, this is what people have been saying a lot to me is that if you order the the vines, that you order Tokai Friulano yeah. from Rauschedo. 
You don't order Friulano. You yeah, order Tokai. Because here. you might get, you might get, you know, you order Friulano and you get Michele Gargani here. <laughs> yeah, he's Friulano. I'm Friulano. Why not? Yeah. Exactly. I'm not a grape. But, <laughs> but yeah, so Tokai Friulano is the name of the, the grape variety and the name of the, the plant. Yes. Yeah, yes. So, so you're focusing completely on Friulano. Yes, I would focus completely yeah. on that. Also, so because monovarino. so many. Well, that it's all. Little Rebola, little Mavazia. You know, it's you. It, you think a lot every night and every every time you taste different wines, you talk to different people and you hear different answers. But before moving to Friuli, I thought I had a much more clear idea than when I actually moved here. Because a conversation that I've always had has said, why do we have so many grape varieties in Friuli? It creates so much confusion, not only grape varieties, but also so many different styles, which creates so much confusion to the consumer, especially if they are outside of Italy, they're like, well, what does Friuli taste like? Or even Collio taste like, you know, because you get a bottle, it's like, oh, it's fantastic. Maybe it was, you know, the classic blend, the Tokai, Malvasia, Ribolla. And then a week later, it goes by another Collio. It's like, oh, I like Collio. He picks that Collio and it tastes like Sauvignon Blanc. It's like, what does Collio taste like? Right. And so I said, well, why don't, um, my thought was, why don't we just, fo producers focus on that blend, Tokai, Ribolla, Malvasia. Well, it turns out it's a little more complicated than that. Uh -huh. uh, the history is long as of why we have so many different varieties, but uh, I, I, a couple we could exclude, I think, at least for my taste. What would you exclude? Chardonnay. Chardonnay. And Pinot Noir. And perhaps, really? yeah, yeah, and even Cabernet. No, it doesn't mean that those varieties are not good. Right. I They're great. Um, I've tasted some fantastic Chardonnay, the Pinot Nero from Antico Broilo, phenomenal Pinot Nero. Exactly. But my, my, my question is, can they compete with the best in the world? Right. Then why bother? Right. I think the two international, or even three, I would add, but let's say two international varieties that can really compete with the best in the world are Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot, in there my you opinion. Go. You read my mind. Yeah. And so there is definitely a place, a place for them. Although I do think that the true translator of terroir in Friuli, it is Tokai Friulano. Okay. Because you really can taste the different, uh, difference of terroir wherever you plant it. It's really, it, it's a true tr translator. Yeah. It's very transparent. From. Very transparent. Yes. I suppose Sauvignon Blanc, which, you know, always has that aroma, some more, some less. But I think Tokai is really the, where it's at. Now, if you talk to some producers, like uh, Nicola Maferrari from uh, Borgo di Tiglio, he said, well, yes, but I had this vineyard, which was east facing and my Tokai wouldn't ripe. So uh -huh. I planted Sauvignon Blanc. So it was explaining to me that the Eastern exposure in Friuli is better for aromatic varieties. Okay. While the one, it's because it, it's a matter of the light, you know, the morning light, it's, it's a cleaner light. Right. As opposed to Western exposure where you have more of a sea breeze, a dirtier light. Okay. And it's better for- more diffuse. Yes. Yeah. And it's better for Tokai and Imeribola. Oh, okay. Yes. So yes. the quad, see, this is something I'd never heard before, this sort of quality of light type of thing for different varieties. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So Friulano for the white wine. Yes. You want to make a red wine too, though? Or you sticking with it's white? It's too much. It's too much work. <laughs> too much work. Yeah. yeah. Too much work macerating, punching down. Yeah, yeah. Over. Exactly, exactly. So you want to make 500 liters, is that what you said, or 1,000 liters? About 1,000, yeah, yeah. Of of Tokai. Yes. That's your... Because if one body goes bad, you're, all your production is... That's true. It's gone. You're gone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you, like four bariques, that would be. Yeah, just about. Yeah, Makes just sense. about. Yeah. Okay. So um, you have a name for this wine? I have several, I wrote it down, but I'm still, it, it depends if it goes through, but I don't want to have bad luck because it's exactly, the name of the winery route would be exactly where the location is located. Okay. Yeah. The okay. place is located. Yeah. All right. So you don't want to, don't want to. Jinx it. Jinx it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Literally what I was trying to, to remember. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you have so many different things kind of on your plate. So you have a, 
relatively new restaurant that you're trying to run. You're trying to sort of create a special place where people can go and eat and drink special wines. You want to make your own wine too. That's, that's a lot. Too much. Too much. Too much. So you, you, basically you, you don't like to relax. I don't. <laughs> I, I am a masochist, like I said. Really? So, so do you really spend, like, a, do you like spending a lot of time working? Is that something that you always feel like you have to be moving, doing something, creating something? I do. I always complain about it. But then when I have free time, I feel so useless. There, there, not a chance in the world I can stay and, and relax on the couch and do nothing. Right. I, I very rarely watch movies. And I like movies, but I feel like I'm wasting my time. Okay. You got yeah. other things to do. I got things to do. There's so many things to do. In fact, right now, I'm also uh, working on a recipe book of okay. food and cuisine. Cook just book. to add more. Just, yeah. To, like a you didn't have work. enough to do. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's, that's interesting too, because yeah, so you really literally, because that's the impression that I get is like, you, you have a lot of enthusiasm and you have a lot of energy and you want to do all these different things and you just, you want to get them all done. Yeah. So you're, you're, you, hopefully you have, do you have like family? you I mean, you said your brother's helping you. Yes. Uh, do you have a, a significant other or somebody who's you know sort of backing you up on this or are you like flying solo? Well, at the moment I'm flying uh, solo. solo. Yes. Okay. I mean, my, my family supports me. Yeah. You know, with, Is uh, your family here in free? Are they back here too? No, my dad is in Tuscany. Your dad's in Tuscany, okay. And my mom currently in the United States in California. Okay. But she is debating between whether to live here or not, you know, but the thing is about her that when she's there, she misses Italy. When she's in Italy, she, she misses, misses California. There. Okay. Which is understandable. All right. Cool. And, and I, I, you know, I, I should have asked you at the beginning, but how old are you now? 38. 38. You look much younger. Thank I you. just want to tell you, you look like you're in your fucking twenties. I have two livers. You have two livers? Yes. Lucky you. I need it. Can I have one? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I need an extra too. <laughs> anyway, Michele, it's been really great talking to you. Thank you thanks for much. taking the time to come in. It's, I look forward to spending more time at Gial Blanc. We had a great time last night with World Pignolo Day. Yes, so absolutely. That was a it. great time with Ben and with you. And thank you for all of your hospitality last night. So that was super fun. And so, yeah, just when I was there last night, I was like, hey, man, why don't you come in tomorrow and do the podcast? Here we are. And I'm going to publish it tomorrow. So there you go. Wow. I love bang, it. Bang, bang. So. I wanted to be in your podcast so bad. I listen to it all the time. But yeah, I know this, this is a huge, like, I'm really honored that you listen to my podcast. Even last night when you said, oh, man, I've been listening, like binge listening your podcast. I'm like super honored. So thanks, Michele, for, for being a supporter of La Taverna and for coming here and, and talking with us for about almost an hour now. So Wow. Yeah, flu. time flies when you're having yeah, fun. For sure. Anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Michele. Thank you, See you soon. See you.